The story of Hans Bertram and Adolf Klausmann, who were making a goodwill tour of Australia in the Junkers or Junkers aircraft. Things were getting tight, the uh, recession had just really finished, and people were trying to get businesses were trying to get back on their feet. And so Junkers dispatched Bertram and Klausmann and two others to fly around the world and pick up a bit of business. You may remember that in Australia at the time it was a by British. The aircraft took 10 weeks to get to Australia and you can see where it dropped off as it went. So between February and May they were on the move. They conducted a complete overhaul on the Junkers in um, the Netherlands East Indies and it was ready to roll to fly to Australia in May, mid-May. Bertram decided that it would be nice to have a night flight and arrive in Darwin for breakfast. What he hadn't taken into account was it was at the height of the monsoon season and so he ran into all sorts of trouble with cloud from sea level to 20, 30 odd thousand feet and uh, lightning all over the place. And while they made that night flight, they made many, many changes of heading. So they left at midnight and embarked on their six hour journey. The idea was to fly from Copang to Darwin. And the calendar is there for you to take a look at and just to remind you of what date it was, 15th of May. That was their proposed route. They assumed, when they saw land, that they were somewhere near Melville Island. In fact, they were totally unprepared for what they saw. And Bertram made a sketch of the coastline that he observed. He then took the sketch and ran it up and down the map that he had, seeing if he could place that sketch somewhere along the Australian coast. And he finally settled for Melville Island. It was nothing like Darwin, but he said to himself, right, this little sketch that I've made fits here, so we are on Melville Island. It turns out that they weren't. Their actual route took them far south of where he thought he was. In fact, they were about 250 miles in error in a six hour flight. Something drastic went wrong. And so the actual landing was on that little patch of the West Australian coast to the northwest of Wyndham. After four days, the Dutch government decided that a, a gunboat should be sent out from the Netherlands, East Indies. The German consul requested that the Australian government conduct a search, land and sea. And so West Australian Airways were chartered to carry out um, the survey. Nothing was found. State shipping was also asked to keep a lookout. And so if you look at that landing question mark, the red dot, you'll see that the orientation of the coastline, you can just make it out, is in a north-west direction. Bertram decided that what his best move was would be to move up the coastline in a northwest direction, turn the corner and come down the other side to a settlement called Port Coburn. It would have been a great plan had he been on Melville Island, but he wasn't. And that was the plan that he had in his mind for the next six or so weeks. And so what in fact happened was that his actual landing was where the red dot is, and he was attempting to follow that red arrow. And so the actual landing was at position number one on the map there. He decided that if he flew further along the coast, he'd be moving in the direction of the red arrow that I've spoken about, and another flight of that length would get into the top of the peninsula and he'd be able to turn the corner and come back down the other side to Port Coburn. Not so. They'd actually flown further away from settlement uh, of Wyndham. 
what happened when they landed at position number one was that an Aborigine waded out to the aircraft and they tried to conduct a conversation but it was totally unsuccessful because the Aborigine knew no German or English and uh, Klausman and Bertram knew no Aborigine language so it was a total waste of time and the Aborigine just wandered away. So when they used all of their fuel and flown from position one to number two, um, <clears throat> they decided that, well, there's no water where we are now. Let's go back down the coast to where the Aborigine was. He'd obviously have water, otherwise he wouldn't be living there. And so they decided that since the aeroplane had no fuel, that they'd go back to position number one, their original landing point, on foot. <coughs> But about halfway back, they had to cross a shallow inlet. They wanted to look nice when they were found by people. And so rather than wade out in their nice clothes, they stripped off to their underwear, bundled up their possessions, put it on their head and started to wade across the inlet. They hadn't gone far when they saw a log floating in the water. And on a close examination, the log had a couple of nostrils. And then they realised that that log with nostrils had a couple of eyes that were looking their way. And so they took off like a rocket for the shore, dropping their gear that they had over their head. And so there they were, in the middle of nowhere, with virtually no clothes, and items, possessions, which they regarded as valuable, were in the water behind them with the crocodile. So they decided that the best plan at that stage was to go back to position number two and go back up the coast. And so they walked on high ground back to where they had left the aircraft high ground to stay away from crocodiles that might be at sea level and uh, back to the aircraft where there was water in the radiator and so when they got back to the aircraft they thought well this is not much good we've really got to continue this move up the coastline turn left turn left and come down the other side for port coburn they still had this idea that they were on melville island and it was a matter of moving up the coastline. How were they going to do it? They've now been missing for 13 days. <coughs> the calendar shows you there with the red circle on the 15th, and it was the 27th by the time they got back to the aircraft. No news on their movements. No one had seen them, no one had heard from them. The people searching for them had found nothing. In fact, the people were searching for in the, looking in the wrong area and uh, all the searches had been fruitless even though West Australian Airways had conducted um, a couple of surveys. So what they did was they cut down a tree with a pocket knife and a screwdriver and made a, a prop for the wingtip. You can't see where the, the prop was was holding the aircraft up at that wind tip there, the port wind tip. They then removed the port float and cut it nearly in half, cut a couple of holes in the top, made it into a kayak or a canoe. They found a tree which they could make into a mast and to the back end of it they fashioned a rudder. They didn't have many good tools to use and everything was makeshift. And so they put to sea in this canoe, hoping to sail up the coast, turn left, turn left, and down to Port Coburn. And so they sailed out to sea. The rudder broke, though at the mercy of the wind and tide, and you know that the tide up north there varies about 10 metres every few hours, every six hours or so. And so they were carted around by the tide of the wind with no rudder. They 
through a ship approaching them. The state ship Kalinda. And they thought, hello, we're saved. The ship passed them about a mile to one side. Fierce waving, carrying on, shouting. But no one on the ship was looking their way. And so the ship proceeded, so near and yet so far. They then decided that the best idea would be to get back on land because they weren't controlling their movements in the ocean. And the only way they could do that was to paddle. They'd been at sea for three days and then tried another three days of paddling to get back to the shore. The water that they'd taken with them was in very short supply and the ocean had sprayed into it and it had become salty and it wasn't as good as it should be. So disappointed, they paddled back and landed near Cape Bernia. Still believing that they were on Melbourne Island, they decided that they'd walk as far as they could in the direction of Port Coburn. And on reaching high ground, they should be able to see the ocean and Port Coburn. But when they got to high ground, at the end of the arrow there, all they could see was rolling scrub and landscape going off for hundreds of miles. Totally disappointed. In fact, everything that they've done so far just sort of came unstuck. And so they decided that they'd go back to the shore, back to the coast, Cape Bernie. And that's where they settled down. By this stage, Klausman had had a nervous breakdown. He had threatened to kill Bertram and then kill himself to take them both out of their misery. Bertram was having problems with him, but when they got to the coastline, they were prepared to just settle down and die. But on the 13th of the next month, and this is about a month that they'd been on the move, an Aboriginal found a cigarette case. Well, the cigarette case bore the initials HB, Hans Bertram. Now why wouldn't that be out in the bush in this part of Australia? And so for the first time, when the Aborigines took this to Drysdale Mission, people had some idea where they were. They'd been thinking somewhere along the coast, North Australia, we don't know where to look, we don't know where they are. But now they're saying, this has been dropped off to Drysdale and we should be concentrating on the area. So it was the first indication that they might even be alive. And of course the newspapers were dealing with this Australia wide and overseas by this stage. And so if on the map there you can see where the crocodile was. And if they dropped the cigarette case when they were attempting to cross were upset by the crocodile, that was about uh, 120 kilometres. And the Aborigine would have covered that distance in a couple of days. That's probably not the case. The cigarette case could have been dropped somewhere else and a shorter journey to Drysdale. But nevertheless, there was also a handkerchief involved uh, with HB engraved, sorry, on the corner. And so there were people from all aspects uh, directed to look for them. At times there were over 60 people looking for them. There were trackers on foot, there were police on horseback, boats and aircraft started to look for them in earnest in the right area this time for the first time. There were reports that they'd been murdered. In fact, the natives had indicated that they knew the people that had conducted the murder and they were pointed out to the police and the police were arrested two people and had them in chains. And were going to punish them accordingly if they could get proof. Turned out that was all wrong. On the 15th of June, the aircraft was spotted by a West Australian Airways aircraft and a launch from the Wyndham Meatworks visited the site of the aircraft. And so 
on the aircraft, they found a note which had been left there pretty much a month before by Bertram saying that on the 27th of May we were in Australia and today we left the plane in a float and we're heading in a westerly direction. And we've already looked at that, signed at Bertram. And so it wasn't long after that that the Aborigines discovered them in a cave at Cape Bernier. And there we are, when you look at the map, uh, this is a month later. So for a month they've been virtually without water and very little food and they're at death's door. Very happy to be found by the Aborigines. That's a photograph taken um, by one of the crews that were making a film on their um, episode up there. But it gives you an idea, that is the cave that they spent a great deal of time in towards the end of their time being lost. Uh, and that's how they protected themselves with goggles, helmet, face mask, clothes, because flies and mosquitoes were rife and it was just uh, dreadful the way it turned out. Constable Marshall was the man who actually found them and uh, brought them to safety. And both men were brought to Wyndham by boat. They'd been suffering for 53 days by this stage. And when you think of people having a tough time, <clears throat> that sort of number 53 days goes with the bad luck stories from the Arctic and Antarctic and Dr. Livingston and that sort of thing. Um, a long, long time under with real problems. An arrow points to Klausman being taken ashore at Wyndham. And so it was on the 6th that they got to Wyndham. After a period of convalescing and brought to Perth, Bertram came back by air uh, because he was in reasonably good shape. And Klausman came later in the month by ship because he wasn't fit enough to fly. Aero Club pilots from this Aero Club went out to greet the West Australian Airways aircraft that came down the coast with Bertram on board. There had been so much in the newspaper about Bertram that people, everyone was talking about him and his arrival was regarded as being a major occurrence. So there we are, the Aero Club welcomes Bertram. And while he was in Perth, he stayed with Norman Brilli, our founder up there. He got on well with Norman and they decided that it might be possible to retrieve the aircraft. So Bertram and a WA Airways engineer, mechanic, returned to the Atlantis in September. They took with them tools and a spare float, a float from a DH-50, which Norman really had. And so with fuel, tools and the float, they got the aircraft back in the air again. And there it is, you can see the white float is from the DH-50 and the darker float is the original that came with the Junkers. And there it is, arriving and landing at Crawley. There's the Swan Brewery in the background and then being greeted uh, on the river by a number of boats. The aircraft was towed to the foot of Barrack Street, which was really the Perth port in those days. And you can see by the sheds there that that's what was going on. The communications between Fremont and Perth were mainly by uh, river barge. And so the aircraft was lifted out of the water <coughs> and transported by road to Maylands. Klausman had been put into Heathcote for recuperation, but he never fully recovered. He evidently got pretty good treatment and he, from the photos, got on fairly well with the staff. <laughs> but luckily there are, those three in the middle there would have been 
matron to a matronly and kept an eye on things. <laughs> so Bertrand continued with the plan on his own to fly to the eastern states. He had not been used to landing on wheels, and so when the floats were removed and wheels put onto his aircraft, he had a few problems. He was checked out by Norman Brearley, and Brearley said that his techniques weren't good. Landing a float plane, I guess, meant that if you landed on the bay, it didn't matter quite where you touched down. But when you land on somewhere like Maylands or a small airport in Kalgoorlie, you've got to put it in the right spot. And Bertrand wasn't very fay with this, and so the heavy landing in Kalgoorlie got him going off the end of the landing area and through a chicken coop. <laughs> and uh, while that shows the aircraft in reasonable condition, he did quite serious damage to the undercarriage and the propeller. And that delayed his departure for uh, some months. He toured Australia, went to the eastern states, Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Tasmania, and then he was made an offer by uh, Junkers to fly back to Germany, which he did. So in November, he set out to fly back on his own. But in December, <coughs> he ran off the runway at Surabaya and he had to get a new undercarriage and a new propeller from Germany. And it took about three months for that to arrive, a bit more than three months. So in April, uh, he flew into Tempelhof while there was a show on a heroes get together. Some of the German heroes from previous years uh, had gone together in a big show and he flew in and he was made mass rock. So the newspapers got onto that. During and after World War II, Bertram had a successful career as a film director. He evidently had a camera with him while he was on tour or getting around Australia, took plenty of photos, and I don't know whether he had a movie camera or not, but <clears throat> he started to produce films, movie films, which were of a very high quality. In those days, there was censorship in the German hierarchy. Hitler had come to power, or was almost to power, had power, and uh, they wanted to vet every film that was produced and had to get the stamp of approval from the government. Bertram had a few problems to begin with, but as time went on, he conformed and produced some very good films. And there are some of the display items, and I can read this first one, it's in grayscale. Eine große Liebe. A big love. <laughs> um, the first couple of films included a bit about uh, aviation and then he moved into the role of an unbiased film director and rose to the top of the heap. There was another person by the name of Hans Bertram who learned to fly during World War II who was shot down in North Africa and came to Australia as a prisoner of war. Newspaper people thought that it was the Hans Bertram that I've been talking about. As far as I know, it was not. Bertram, the Hans Bertram that I've been talking about, never came back to Australia. He stayed in Germany, working away as a film director. The newspaper journalists of the time were scrambling for news. They put anything into the paper that came to mind, and uh, that's how a lot of people think that he came back to Australia. Not so, as far as I'm concerned. There's two books written by Barbara Winter. And if you need to know anything about Hans Bertram and the episode I've been talking about, um, they are the book to read. It's the same text in both books, just a different cover produced at different times by a different uh, company. If you can read German, Flugin der Hohle um, was written by Bertrand himself. A replica of the Atlantis was built 
for the four-part miniseries which was conducted uh, by the ABC in 1985. That replica is in the Rafa Museum in Bull Creek. And so if you go and have a look at it, this will probably give you some understanding of uh, the background of the aircraft and the people who were in it. So that's the story of the Atlantis. I was at uh, New Norsey at the time and Bertrand's son was in the same class as me and so we were kept up to date with, uh, with the guys on that uh, uh, was part of history and uh, it was true that he uh, played a leading role in the whole episode and, uh, and it's now all part of history which we are now becoming aware of. Drysdale Mission, sometimes called Togo, uh, was run by the Benedictine monks who run New Norcia.